Hi, St. Edward Alliance Church. We are the Skilton Douglas family. Today is the third Sunday of Advent, and if we were gathered in person, we would take time during our service to light the Advent candle and share scripture together. But since we can't gather in person today, we invite you, wherever you are, to light the joy candle with your family and for someone to read today's verse, which will be on the screen. Today we'll be reading Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. Let's get, oh, sorry. Let's continue to worship our Savior, the good news of great joy.
I want to take a moment and just thank our church family. You have been so generous through this season in the middle of COVID when it seems like everything is kind of shutting down. Your hearts have been getting bigger and bigger and your generosity has been more and more. And God has allowed us to use that together with you to uh, minister to so many people in so many different ways. Your faithfulness has allowed us to continue what God has asked us to do week after week after week. I love serving together with you. We're going to take a moment and we're going to pray together as we've been praying over the last few weeks, a prayer of just expressing how we feel about what God is wanting to do in us and through us through our giving. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, There's nothing that we have that you haven't given us. To spend everything on ourselves and to give without sacrifice, that's the way of the world. But we who call Jesus Lord is determined to practice generosity with free hearts, fixing our hope on God and not on the uncertainty of wealth. We desire to be rich in good deeds and willing to share all that we have. Lord, (laughs) help us to be trustworthy with the little so that we can be trusted with much. Help us to give what we cannot keep to gain what we cannot lose. Above all, help us to be generous because you, the Father, are generous. May we show what we are like to all the world. May this be true of our community. Amen. Thank you for taking a moment right now to participate with us in a free heart of gratitude and generosity. God bless you, and it's so exciting to serve together with you. Have a good week.
church family. And the Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to Timothy, found in 2 Timothy 3.16, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And again, referring to the Bible, the scriptures, we read these words from Joshua in Joshua 1, verse 8. It says, Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Now, there's some fascinating research that has been done by the Center for Bible Engagement that provides some scientific support for what both the Apostle Paul and Joshua already knew. So they did this massive study, like over 400,000 people, and they looked at the correlation between how many times a week people read the Bible and reflected on it and how it shaped a variety of behaviors and life experiences. And what was particularly fascinating and instructing, instructive for us is what the research showed as far as frequency is concerned. So they found that if you're in the Bible one day a week, it really has negligible impact on several key areas of your life. If you're in the, the Bible two times a week, negligible effect. Three times a week, negligible effect. In fact, the lives of Christians who only engage the Bible one to three times a week are statistically the same as the lives of non-believers on a number of key metrics. So that's interesting all by itself. But here was the amazing discovery that someone who engages the Bible for the research showed that in the lives of over 400,000 people, once, twice, three times a week, in terms of a scale, it's basically flatline. No discernible difference. And yet at four times a week or more, literally it goes off the charts. And I found that those who engage at least four times a week, um, those who were feeling lonely, dropped 30%. Anger issues drops 32%. Alcoholism, drops 57%. Relational issues, especially in the context of marriage, drops 40%. Pornography use and other sexual sin drops 61 to 68%. And then, super significant, those who are feeling spiritually stagnant, so a sense of feeling of being stuck, uh, not really going anywhere with God, drops 60%. More scripture engagement also results in a follower of Jesus who is more active in their faith and is growing more spiritually and impacting more people. The study showed that those who read or listen to the Bible at least four days a week are 228% more likely to share their faith in Jesus with others, 231% more likely to be involved in discipling others, so helping others grow in their walk with Jesus, 407% more likely to memorize scripture, which has benefits in every area of life uh, for an apprentice of Jesus. In case you're missing this, one to three days a week, no statistic, statistical difference on any of these kinds of behaviors, four times a week or more, profound impact. So for anyone who is feeling spiritually stagnant, lonely, struggling in their marriage, wrestling with anger issues, or anyone who wants their life to be relevant to what God is doing, one of the first questions to ask yourself is, am I consistently, week after week, getting into the Bible at least four times? You see, when you, when you read the Word of God, you are filling your mind with God's thoughts, God's imaginations, God's mental patterns, and God's way of thinking. You are drowning out the voice of the enemy with all of his lies, and you're listening to the voice of truth. And this leads to a kind of, the Hebrew word for it is shalom. Shalom encompasses um, a life of rest in God. It encompasses peace, wholeness, joy, a sense of everything being in its right place. It's what we experience when the soul of a person is in tune with its maker. The more we steep in the Word of God, the Bible, at a minimum of four times a week, the more this shalom will permeate our well-being and strengthen our hearts and bring, bring blessing to those around us. So the first question is around uh, how much engagement with the Bible do I need to experience tangible benefits? Perhaps the second question is then, 
what do I read and how do I get the most out of it? Now for that, I'm gonna send you to our new website. I've got some suggestions for you there. But for now, what I wanna do is I wanna make you aware that starting on January 1st, we are going to engage in a 40-day prayer challenge that I'll tell you a bit more about next week. But I wanna let you know right now that we'll be engaging as part of that 40 days, uh, a 40-day devotional reading plan that we're gonna invite you to do with us that will include a chronological reading uh, through all four Gospels, talking about Jesus' life. We want to begin the first 40 days of 2021 being drawn into the life of Jesus as we read and reflect on him together. So more on that in the next couple of weeks, uh, but today I want to get you thinking about how you might arrange your weeks to spend at least four days uh, a week in the Bible. Let's face it, with the season of isolation and loneliness we're currently in. A season of sadness for so many and with the heartbreaking news this week that we won't have opportunity to gather in person you know, with our family and loved ones over Christmas. In a season where so many are feeling lethargic about life in general, many are feeling spiritually stagnant, many struggling with anger and frustration, discouragement. Now is not the time to be indifferent to engaging the scriptures. God is willing to meet us there if we will create the space to do the same. So I'm going to pray into this and then I'm going to pray into uh, one of the Psalms here for us. So let's pray together. So Heavenly Father, this has been a, a, a particularly a difficult week uh, with perhaps for many their, their worst fears uh, confirmed that our Christmas celebrations are being limited to our uh, immediate households, uh, for others, perhaps their worst fears being realized that severe restrictions might uh, mean they lose their business. Of course, those who are, are looking for work and fears about whether or not work's going to be available in these days. Other, of course, the, the strain and overwhelm and exhaustion and fears surrounding all those and all aspects of our health care uh, system. Uh, these things have been mounting for weeks now, and, and even knowing that with this week's announcements, there's, there's, uh, you know, there's still a long road ahead to get to a place of uh, health and uh, sustainability in these things. God, we need you. And I've just been sharing here about how your word breathes life into us and how, how much we need that. And I've been reminded of Psalm 33 and just want to pray this psalm back to you. So we agree with the psalmist when he says, What joy for the nation whose God is the Lord, whose people he has chosen as his inheritance. The Lord looks down from heaven and sees the whole human race. From his throne he observes all who live on the earth. He made their hearts so he understands everything they do. The best equipped army cannot save a king, nor is great strength enough to save a warrior. Don't count on your war horse to give you victory. For all its strength, it cannot save you. But the Lord watches over those who fear him, those who rely on his unfailing love. He rescues them from death and he keeps them alive in times of famine. We put our hope in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord for our hope is in you alone. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. What hope we hold this starlit night A king is born in Bethlehem journey long we seek the light that leads to the hallowed manger ground what fear we felt in the silent day for hundred years can he be found but broken by a baby's cry rejoice in the
this offering exalted now the king of kings praise the the hallowed manger ground Emmanuel Emmanuel God incarnate to dwell Emmanuel Emmanuel Praise His name Emmanuel Praise His name Emmanuel Oh, praise His name Oh, praise His name Well, Daisy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Jeremy and I have just been so looking forward to being able to have this conversation with you and, and for our church family and for everyone who's tuning in as well to be able to hear just a small part of your story. So Daisy, just as we dive in and talk about some of your experience of God as, as your everlasting father, before we get to those things, would you just share with us a little bit about um, how long you've been at St. Albert Alliance Church and how you came to St. Albert Alliance Church. Right. Um, so I originally come from Uganda, uh, but I'm also adopted here, so I have a Canadian family. And so I was uh, sponsored through uh, Compassion uh, by my adopted family here. And so as I came to um, St. Albert, I came through the hub, uh, Pastor Michael invited me to come and um, uh, lead worship. And so one day my father is driving through and he's bringing me to church and he's like, Daisy, this is where I picked your picture from. I'm like, <laughs> how did that happen? And so, and at that point I was looking for a church, a home church where to go. And I just felt the Holy Spirit convict. He's like, this is home. <laughs> well, Daisy, you and I had an opportunity to have a conversation earlier this fall. Yes. Uh, that again just felt like the Holy Spirit just kind of set up for us. I didn't know we were going to have this conversation. Yeah. And, and I was so profoundly struck by your experience of God as Father. When we were thinking about this current series we're in for Advent and you know we thought who, who might be able to give some insight into what it's like to experience God as Father. Uh, I had one name, uh, <laughs> four friends in my mind, and so tell us how uh, you, you've come to know God as, as Father, because some of this looked like for you. So I come from a very humble family. Um, my mom was the most richest woman you would find spiritually, but not with materialistic things and so um, I grew up in a in a the area I grew up actually was uh, the house we were living in was a public bathroom that she transformed it was a slum and she transformed it into a shelter so she could take care of her kids I'd never met my biological father so there was no man in the house and so um, every time I asked her she'd be like God is your father God is your father but it never hit me I'm like huh and as a child you'll always trust what your mom says right and so that's the environment I grew up in and food was always a problem and stuff like that but my mom tried her best and uh, this particular day though she didn't have and I remember I was hungry and she looks at me with almost tears in her eyes and tells me Daisy I don't have money I've tried all I can but I, I, I don't have money this is at night and I'm just crying and she says but there is someone you can talk to Talk to your father in heaven. If he provides, I will be able to give you. And so hearing that, I turn in a lot of pain and I say, 
God, I am hungry. Abba, I'm hungry. And um, I slept. No manna fell <laughs> that night. But in the morning, because I think I'd overly cried that night, um, I, I overslept. So it was around 11 a.m. in the morning and I wake up and I walk out of this small little room and I see my mom walking in a distance, smiling with two huge bugs in her hands. And now <laughs> with the situation I was in, meat was luxury, rice was luxury. The only food I really knew was beans and corn. That, that was step of food because that was what was cheap. But my mom comes with a bag full of rice, full of meat, and there's all these foods that I usually had at Christmas um, because it was Christmas. That's when she would, you know, save up some money. And I'm confused at this moment. And I ask, I'm like, mom, um, what, what happened? You said you didn't have money. And she looks at me and smiles and says, your father answered. And that point changed my entire life. I'm like, wait, I can't see him, but when I pray, he hears me? And so from that point onward, I started to relate with God as my father. I started to just trust God with that childlike faith, believing that when I asked, he would provide. And that's how I came to um, just embrace God as my father. Mm -hmm. How did your experience of God as your father grow as you did? Yes. So in your teenage years yes. and then even coming to the point where now you're in Bible college preparing for ministry. Yes. How has some of that journey looked for you? Ooh, um, a lot of people usually say, wow, you have trusted in God all your life and you've had so much faith in God. Good for you. And I tell them, no, it wasn't me. It's been God's faithfulness because my mom went to be with Jesus when I was around 15. And uh, this is growing up from that six-year-old girl. I'm going to church. She's brought me up in church and one morning um, she dies. And this is the only woman I knew who loved me. Um, like mom was everything. I didn't care what, was, what I didn't have, but mom was everything. And I remember that morning when my mother passed on when I got the news, I remember running out of that little house and just looking to the stars. I'm like, wait, I'm an orphan. What has just happened? And I ran back inside the house and I knelt down and I made a very simple prayer. As I was crying, I said, God, you've taken away the only person in my life that I love. The only person I know who loves me too. And now the world calls me a total orphan. And I said, Father, I don't want to feel like a total orphan. I got blinded by pain. I got so bit down by life. And, and that child in me who had so much faith started to dwindle. There was just so much pain that happened that I almost lost my faith. I grew up knowing he loves me, but because of the pain that I'd felt, I became so afraid of his will. And so I'm like, I, I gotta make it. I want to make money. I, I, and then I realized I had this beautiful gift that the Lord has given me, a voice to sing. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to make money out of this. And so I, I started to go sing in clubs, sing in, 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 in different places just so I could get food to eat or trying to make it. My focus stunned from serving God and turning into, um, you know, just fame, money, and, and whatever that comes along with that. And through it all, God was so faithful with me. He was so patiently waiting, patiently providing, even in that scenario through my, my, my teenage life to where I am, he never stopped providing. He never stopped protecting. I remember this particular time in the place where I grew up. It was a very dangerous area. And because mom had died and I became very suicidal, I didn't know it then, but now I realize what was happening. And I would walk in the most dangerous places at 3 a.m. in the morning and pass the place. And then in the morning, news would go that someone had been murdered at the same place I had passed. Now look back and I prayed to him, um, on uh, one of the nights and I said, God, now I want a father. <laughs> and I was telling him like, yeah, I know you're my father, but I can't see you. I want you to provide me with a father. And years later, the Lord brings the same man whom he used to sponsor me through life to become my father. 
And I realize now that the prayer I made that night at 15 years old has been upheld. I focused so much on the pain that I was feeling and yet looking at that, God has never made me feel like an orphan. I've never felt like an orphan. And so, yeah, I, I owe him everything, <laughs> literally, yeah. Daisy, oh, just love, we love you. We love what God is doing in you. Thank, thank you for being willing to just in, invite us as a church family just into this little window. Again, I feel so privileged to having heard a bit more of the longer version and just seeing the threads uh, that you've alluded to here uh, has been so strengthening for my own heart. I came home from our conversation and just uh, shared with Lisa just the, the way in which God has, has expressed himself ex uh, as father to you. And so thank you for, for this and trust that he will continue to, um, you will continue to know him as your father in an experiential way and uh, bless many others on your, your call uh, to him, to serve him in the ways that he lays out for you in the days ahead. So Amen. bless you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I am just getting organized to make some treats for our staff. My, uh, my favorite Christmas cookie is the ginger snap and I figured in this season, it'd be great to share it with uh, the rest of our team. So we're getting prepared for Christmas together. 14 years ago, right around this time, we were expecting, Kim and I were expecting uh, our first child. She, we had this excitement uh, of the Christmas season coming. We had the excitement of uh, a soon to be born son, uh, all the anticipation and all the excitement built around it. Uh, right around this time, Kim's parents were joining us and they came out to, to give us a hand and be able to be a support wherever they could be. And, and we all were growing with this anticipation of a, a son that's gonna be born soon. Um, we had due dates that were set. We thought we were you know, moving towards it. Uh, I, I don't know what maybe your experience uh, as women having kids, but late in your pregnancy, it, it seems like the glow, the uh, excitement of pregnancy sort of wears off and there's this sense of like can we just be done like can we just get to the part where we're, we have a kid that is born and and carry on in the experience of being parents um, Kim was starting to get to that phase about this time uh, she was towards the end of the pregnancy our due dates were coming but we had Christmas to look forward to and celebrate uh, the thing that happened is Christmas came uh, Christmas Eve came Christmas came Still no kid, due dates passed, still no kid. Uh, New Year's Eve came and still no kid. As each day ticked by, Kim was like searching the internet for any old wives tale on how to um, bring labor on and how to start the process and, and do those things. Uh, you have to remember, we were living in Fort McMurray, boom time, lots going on, average age was 30, and the maternity ward at our hospital was like popping out kids as fast as they could um, make it happen. And so the need to get into the queue was pretty significant. Uh, Kim, trying to play some of the card of being a nurse and, and connecting with some of the nurses there, was hoping that she could get herself into that queue. But unfortunately, that wasn't really happening. I'll never forget as we ticked down the days and each of these you know, old wives tales of how to induce labor just wasn't working, uh, the stress, the anxiety, the frustration, uh, Kim was like, I am just done with being pregnant. Let's get this kid out. And it wasn't happening. I'll never forget the morning. It was a Sunday morning. It was January 7th. I come downstairs and Kim is at the kitchen table in tears. Uh, she had just got off the phone with a call to the hospital trying to, to get in queue to be induced and uh, to no avail. And so there was actually a bottle of castor oil. Castor oil was kind of the last of the last resorts in order to uh, see labor induced at, at home. And uh, that was her last thing. She didn't want to go that route, but it was sitting there kind of as I'm at this point. And I remember she's in tears and the emotions are there and her mom and I are trying to, to navigate that and manage that and trying to, to just walk with her, support her and encourage her in this. Um, and so after having a bit of a conversation, I gingerly walk out of the kitchen and on my way to work at the church. 
uh, partway through the service, I get this call though from home. And so quickly answer it, walk out of the, the auditorium space and, and here it's Kim saying she got on the list. She's going to be induced later that, saf- that afternoon. And uh, so off we went to the hospital and uh, a number of hours later, we welcomed the birth of our son, Ryan. And we were ecstatic. Kim was ecstatic that that season of being pregnant was done. And, um, but at the same moment, in the same time frame, there was this sense of, uh, I don't know if terror is the right word, uh, worry, concern, because the weight of the fact that we were now parents. We now had this little human that was looking to us for uh, safety, for protection, for provision, uh, for love, um, and to be nurtured, to be cared for. Uh, I think the weight of that sort of clicked in Uh, in my mind and in my heart, the moment I uh, put Ryan into the car seat in our car for our trip home. That drive home, you think about all the ways you need to be careful as you're driving and watching out for all the other drivers. There was an added weightiness to our experience and our existence. I was pretty fortunate that um, I had a fantastic dad that was uh, so supportive, so encouraging. He was a, a huge cheerleader. He was the one that was just there to push me to continue to pursue the dreams, the passions, to to feel like I could achieve anything I wanted. And so there, there was a pretty high bar set. And my hope, my desire is that I would I would be and become a great dad, a dad that would just support and cheer and be all those things we could hope for in a dad. But the truth is, just like every dad, we fall short in great ways and in small ways. Uh, The reality is there's times where we should push instead of pulling. And there's times where we've been distant when we should have been close. Uh, There's times where we should have been quiet when we've talked. Um, The challenge of being a dad is significant because we carry with us our own baggage and our own stuff that we bring to the table. Uh, I know that across the board, for all of those watching, tuning in with us, that there's a variety of dad experiences from the good and the bad to the ugly. Um, And so when you hear the word uh, father, when you hear the word dad, there's often an emotion that comes with it, often an experience that's tied to it. And so in this Christmas season, as we hear these scriptures proclaimed, talking about the the birth of Christ and, and the one that Isaiah, we've been looking at in Isaiah, that speaks of the promise of um, light breaking into the darkness. And, and here comes a child born to us, and he will be known as Wonderful Counselor, as Mighty God, as Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. Uh, you may read that or hear that name, Everlasting Father, and there's a, a twinge that comes in your heart. There's an emotion that comes uh, as a response to that. There's a, maybe a, even disappointment, or discouragement, or, or frustration. There's like, a, it's, I don't want anything to do with that because of the experience I've had with my own father. Maybe there's a, a place where we sell God short because of our experience with our own fathers in our situations. Uh, the truth is that We navigate life built out of our experience. And so often the things that we read, even as we read things in Scripture, we we put over top of our emotions, our experience, over top of some of these things. And so as Isaiah speaks these words, he's actually challenging his people to think differently about what a father is. See, in Isaiah's time, the people would have understood father as their own biological father, but they also would have attached that title to a king. And so often the kings were referred to as fathers of the kingdom. They had a responsibility to lead, to protect, and to provide for the people. And so when we think of father, as Isaiah is speaking this to the people that he is with, he also is speaking to us to challenge our thinking and our perspective of what a father is and who a father is. I'm going to throw these in because Our staff is going to get hungry this afternoon. While those cook, I want to take some time to look at the picture that Isaiah paints for us. The the picture that he begins to to speak to his people about what a father could be, what a father should be, and how we can hold up a picture of who Jesus is in that time. See, it's interesting the way that he describes... The Father. He, he uses the word everlasting, which is 
encouraging in this season. It, it builds an, an understanding that Jesus is through all eternity. I, I love the passage from Hebrews chapter 13 that, Jesus, that says Jesus is the same yesterday as he is today as he will be forever. In this season where there has been great uncertainty, where things seem to change you know, moment to moment, day to day, new regulations, new restrictions, do this, don't do that. You know, how do we navigate these times? Uh, for me in this season, especially this picture that God is unchanging has been significant and encouraging. Because in this season where there's uncertainty, the invitation is say to know and recognize it, that God is everlasting, that he is through all eternity. It encourages me to build my hope on that. It encourages me to build my trust on that. It encourages me that I can actually build the foundation of my life upon something that isn't going to be changed in the next day or the next week or the next month. And so Isaiah speaks these words and he tells us that there's a child that's going to be born for us and his name will be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Now he's not saying that Jesus is coming as the Father, but he is saying that Jesus, through his life, through the way that he functioned, the way that he displays uh, his character and nature. Actually, he carries the nature and character of the Father with him in everything that he does. That Jesus, as he lived, as he interacted with people, as he walked alongside, as he demonstrated the heart of the kingdom, he's actually revealing the nature of the Father for us, the nature of the Father to us. See, people often would look to the idea of a savior that would come. And they would look to this idea that he would come as a mighty God and that there would be this overthrow of the existing government, that he would rule in power and authority. But Jesus, as he came, he actually showed us a different way of ruling and reigning. He showed us a way of ruling and reigning by providing comfort and being strong. He was the, the perfect picture of the Father God amongst us. And as he lived, he showed us the nature and character of what an everlasting father actually looks like. I want you to think for a minute in this scripture Jesus speaks to. And he says, ah, Jesus replied, he said, I've been with you all this time, Philip. It's from John chapter 14, verse 9 to 11. It says, I've been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am. Anyone who has seen me has seen the father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me and does his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. See, Jesus was pointing to the fact of the, inter, the interconnectedness of the, the Father and the Son, that as Jesus walked and lived, he was living out the purposes of his Father, the one who sent him as a display of his love for us. I want us to think of what is the picture of a, a perfect father. For many of us that you might be tuning in and be like, man, my father wasn't perfect by any stretch. But what are those characteristics? What are, what are the nature of a perfect father? I think some of those are, are things like a love, love lavishly poured out, a, a support, encouragement, a provision, protection, being present, being with, being alongside, grace that's offered grace that's given. We see Jesus display those characteristics, those, those natures in so many different interactions that we read throughout the gospel. Some of them that come to mind are Jesus as a provider. When we see Jesus taking a couple fish and a few loaves of bread and providing for 5,000. We see Jesus providing for some average fishermen and he fills their net to overflowing, helping them to, to meet their needs. We see Jesus as a, a protector. We see a woman caught in adultery and brought before him and, and with the judgment and condemnation of, of a group of people. And yet Jesus stands and directs their attention away to say, actually, look at your own hearts. But then he invites this woman to a new way of life that would know and experience wholeness and fullness. We, we see Jesus protecting, calming the storm with the disciples as they're crossing the sea. And this storm rages and there's worry and fear in their hearts. And he speaks to the storm to bring calm as one who protects and provides. Uh, one of the great pictures of uh, the heart of the father that Jesus points to is in the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. 
Uh, the story has always challenged me, always encouraged me, always invited me to meet with Jesus because I think lots of times we have this picture of God the Father as one who would sit there with judgment and condemnation, one who would wave a finger and, and point in disapproval. And yet Jesus paints this picture of the heart of a father, the heart of God the Father for us in this story because there's this young son who comes to his dad and he says, I want my inheritance. And that very act is such an act of disrespect to his father. And his father, probably concerned and distraught in the moment, gives his son the, the, his part of the inheritance and he goes off. The son goes off and he squanders it. He blows it. He wastes it. And when he comes to the end of himself, the end of his resources, the end of his time, the end of his stuff, he looks back and he's like, oh, maybe I could be a servant to my dad's house. And the story comes as the son begins to walk back. It says the father sees him a long way off and he runs to him and he wraps his arms around him and he invites him in to receive grace. He invites him in to be restored to family. That's God's heart for us. That's the reason he sends his son is to make possible that restoration of relationship that we were created for. Romans 8 Verse 15 speaks to it, says, You have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as as his own children. So now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. See, the work of Christ on our behalf is putting us in a right standing with God. It putting us in right standing with the Father in heaven, who we were created with for relationship with, who we were created in the image of. And Jesus puts us back in that right relationship, that right place, that right standing, so we could return to relationship with Him. And so, Jesus invites us to experience and receive the heart of the Father that's poured out for us to experience and receive the grace and the mercy that is displayed through the story of the prodigal son. To know and experience a father that that comes to protect and provide, to love and to encourage and to support and to push on into the purposes and plans that he has for us. This Advent season, we've been talking about preparing a room. Lots of times we make preparations in the Christmas season, uh, preparing our homes, preparing food, Uh, Making space for Him um, is the call of Advent. It's the preparation and the waiting. And so this Christmas, this Advent season, I want to invite you to come and meet Jesus, who displays the heart and the nature of the everlasting Father, the one who is for you, the one who stands on edge looking towards you. His heart is turned towards you. And He invites you to come and meet with Him to come and be with Him, to come and experience His love, to come and experience His heart, to be encouraged because He is one who is everlasting. He is one who is unchanging. He is one who has a foundation that we can build our lives upon. And so it begins as we choose to make space. It begins as we choose to, to turn our attention to the one whose attention is already turned towards us. One of those ways that we can do that is to be able to join us in this Advent devotional series that we've been engaging with. You can sign up for it on our website. There'll be a link in the chat boxes that you can join in on. Uh, You can jump in on our app. But to make space in this Advent season, an Advent season that's about waiting and preparing. And as we wait, we wait on a God who displays the heart of a father for us. A perfect father, not, not shaded, not, not jaded, not um, missing, not absent, but one who is present, one who loves, one who protects, one who provides. That's God's heart for us. And my prayer is that we would experience that this season as we receive the words presented to us by Isaiah. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, And the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and his government and its peace will never end. i got to grab these cookies so that our staff can enjoy them. I hope you have a great Christmas season. Thanks for tuning in and being with us. Ha, ha, ha.
<laughs> I was like, hey, I might, nope. Right. <laughs> and then I, Thank you for joining us today. I don't know about you, but in my home, we are busily preparing for the celebration of Christmas. Christmas might look a little bit different for us this year, but the meaning and the joy of Christ remains the same. Now, if you're new, you can text first time to the number on the screen. We would love to meet you. We would love to get you connected into our church community. Or if you want prayer or a blessing, maybe your family wants prayer, your children, your youth, adult wants prayer, anybody wants prayer, there's links in the chat right now. And now remember this link is only live during the Sunday morning and our prayer team is waiting to pray together with you. Now let's all say the church benediction together as we go and be the church in the places that we live, learn, work and play, may we experience the grace and love of the everlasting Father, that we would join Him bringing the kingdom of God to bear with a love that has been lavishly poured out through Christ for the world. Amen. Have an incredible week, church family.